Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, Sam Webster-Harris, diving into the psychology of self-improvement and helping people define their own version of success and then achieving it. On the show today, I have two brilliant YouTubers who chose to ignore the traditional path out of university and build their own success. Zach and Jay built The Zach and Jay Show into a channel with over a million subscribers and the whole time they got paid to do some amazingly fun experiences in the process. During their journey, they learned loads about building their own version of success and of course how YouTube works and success in just the modern world and era that we live in. And one thing I find is that it's funny how even though times change, so much of success in life is about just showing up with dedication and just being a very lovely person to the people around you and helping others. Zach and Jay truly helped lots of other small YouTubers break out whilst they are building their own channel, and it's only helped them in the long run. During our discussion, we're going to learn some of their biggest mistakes, the top mindsets for making any project work, and where YouTube will be in five years' time. You're going to love it. I haven't really introduced exactly what it is you guys do on this show, but you want to like kind of explain that quickly? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we run the Zach and Jay Show, which is a YouTube channel. We've got 650,000 subscribers. Been going for about a year and a half now. And the whole kind of ethos behind the channel is we're living in the best time in the world to be alive. Why wait to do anything? Why wait to live? Why wait to use these opportunities? Get after it and live kind of the best life. Like we've never been in a better time where you can create change for your own life or for other people. So we are kind of a living example of how you can take a high vis and a camera, sneak into loads of places and make a career off it. There's literally no other time in the world where sneaking into places could have been a job. And we do way more than that on the channel. We don't run a lemonade stand outside Bill Gates' house in America. We've done the longest bus ride in America. We've done sneaking into London's biggest marketing awards and doing an elevator pitch on stage to uh, push the Zach and Jay show to all these brand managers that were in the room. So... Yeah, we just believe we're living in the best time in the world to be alive and there's no reason to wait to take advantage of it. And if you do take advantage of it and grab it with both both hands, you can see some crazy things and enjoy crazy, crazy life or an enjoyable one. Yeah, no, I really like the sort of third door philosophy in terms of like, if you guys had tried going to like BBC and pitching yourselves like Ant and Deck as a pair or something, I couldn't take, so there's so many people trying to just be like a duo to get famous, but just do cool stuff that kind of, can have fun and actually make good content around it and then sure if you guys wanted to actually be on tv now you probably could actually pitch a show but you don't need to because you've got your own show yeah exactly yeah it's just funny on tv like we we, we did we were actually on a show pants on fire it's called and we were doing crazy challenges around the around europe and there were celebrity judges like jimmy carr and maya jammer Catherine ryan that's one of the spice girls and, and they would guess whether or not we did the did the challenges or not and we blocked a live audience and and that was kind of cool. But throughout that whole process, they thought they were doing us a massive favor by letting us go on TV. And in the negotiations, I kind of said, like, look, guys, we're taking a bit of a risk here. And they were like, what? You're taking a risk? This is a huge opportunity for you. And we're like, guys, yeah, I mean, you, you just completely don't understand this YouTube space. The youngest billionaire in the world, like, literally in the world, is at Instagram. And she's Kylie Jenner. You just don't understand the power and value of having your own audiences on these platforms. You think, TVs, the dots bollocks, and everyone's shiny and perfectly good looking with a load of makeup artists and red carpets, but you just don't need any of that anymore to be successful. And we've had quite a lot of talks with BBC and they've gone out with ideas and they look, we'll fund the biggest ideas and we'll do production. And we're just like, why would we want to do that? We've got a channel where it's compounding growth. Every time we grow, we then, we, we kind of have got those people to sell to. We've got those people to more ideas to we've got those people to engage with but if you do a tv channel you just kind of the channel kind of gets all that benefit and the program gets all that benefit so yeah it's, it's an interesting one to do mm, i guess kind of like publishing more self-publishing kind of thing with like music or books or anything and same like yeah you, know, you can try and be on the radio show or you can start your own podcast so you gotta hustle a lot more to make it work but yeah well, well i think of doing something like that is kind of the the start of approval i know where we did our tv show we built up by this youtube channel on our own call we literally like filming videos editing videos but had complete create control over every aspect of everything we were doing and as soon as we did tv 
to my friends at home, to uh, to kind of like my parents, to to all those kind of people. They were like, "Wow, you made it! You've done! It. You're in the TV!" And to to us, it just didn't feel that way. We were just like, we got lack of control. We feel like we're we're filling someone else's vision of what this show actually is. And we always felt like puppets. Yeah, but it's getting told what to do, which is a bit of a shock to the system. Yeah. So again, like like you decided to podcast. Like, if you were part of the radio network or whatever i'm sure you you wouldn't be able to uh, compete freedom away but who you who you were booking what you were talking about and you started this podcast saying that you were naked from the waist down so on you're not censored in any sort of way either so um, that that's the kind of beauty of the well, time i guess you can reach more people out uh, with less yeah yeah it's interesting and it's certainly been nice for myself having the control to like interview random people that Technically speaking, you'd never sort of put on the BBC, but just was suspiciously happy. I was like, I just want to know why you're so happy, mate, and these kind of things, or like interview the hitman, that kind of stuff. And it's sort of a bit harder to kind of do that officially. <laughs> Three. Yeah, that's why I feel happy, bro. <laughs> BBC, you just go. Yeah, yeah. So, in terms of the first breaking into events things, does it still scare you or excite you as much now? Or do you are you just like, oh, Glastonbury will break into that kind of thing? Or yeah, have you tried Glastonbury? Because that's like meant to be a really hard one. So yeah, yeah it took me thirty six hours. It was hell. <sighs> yeah, I had like five farmers who were going to bump me in, bail on me, just consistently after the other over the space of thirty six hours. I had to camp outside Mendit Council. And I'm like, oh, from garden. Like, I remember getting out of my little tent at 7 a.m. and people were just, I was just in there, like, the, the front garden is like where the council works and be getting all sorts of locked into them. Sorry, sorry about that. And just having sorts of money to rule over on. Yeah, got in. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, I think it will always be exciting. Like, we, we do it, we definitely do less of it now, but that's just a result of that. not wanting to be pigeonholed into a certain style of content. Like, we, last summer we kind of were. Uh, before all festivals were right off, when we were still doing it, not even documenting it from video, we, we were just coming kind of doing it to have the most fun at a festival. Like, instead of being in a crowd of thousands of people, we were like stage side watching Chance the Rapper, which very few people actually get to be. So, yeah, we still feel like that is a key to life, which we kind of hold. And anytime we feel like tapping into it, we can't, because it's just a shared fun well, really. Mm. Do you think you get away with things a lot more because you say you're doing it for YouTube? So, like, people then realize that you're cool, but then they're like, oh, well, stay because you're cool. It's definitely nice to have. Like, we, we haven't actually had that many scenarios where we're helped, like, we've been cool or we, like, had to face any sort of repercussions for the actions, really. Well, I do think, again, because it's harmless and everything we have released have been a real bit nature. We've not disrespected anyone. We've kind of just kept ourselves to ourselves. But yeah, I feel like it's definitely a nice backup to have. If you're about with a camera and a high vis, you're not know, a kind of weird of trying to get close to these famous people. You, you're that creative. you got like, sort of, they can check up on you and be like, oh yeah, you are this person rather than like, oh, you're like a stalker or something weird. Yeah, it yeah, definitely helps. <laughs> so I've certainly found like running the podcast, it's just like a great life hack in terms of if you just want to talk to interesting people, they'll make time for you. Whereas it's just hard to have like the level of conversation that you can have with someone that you want to get to know or even if it's someone that you kind of met somewhere and you sort of said you do business together or something but you just can't have like a proper hour conversation to actually get to know them better to then do something you just have the excuse yeah it's a great, so it's a great excuse to just have a long chat to learn about yeah well, certainly imagine for you guys it's just like it's just a really good forcing function to make you do interesting stuff like the 36 hour bus journey and these kind of things that sort of you probably should do it at some point in your life, but like at the moment when the option's there to do it, you're like, oh, I'm not sure. But like the way of life is to kind of live like things that are interesting stories for yourself and actually have more enjoyment. And if you literally have to tell stories out of what you're doing, you're more like to tell yourself a more interesting story by like living an interesting story kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think people think like if you're filming something, you're not there at the moment present, whereas like we found kind of some of the best moments of our life has been when we're out recording things and actually pushing each other because we want the end result of videos to be better. I think it's quite easy in normal day life not to want to upset the Apple car doing a thing that's like a little bit out there or kind of break. Whereas like we we're kind of financially incentivized in that respect to, to go out and, and really push the boundaries of 
to stop and you probably won't do it if you weren't filming it for a look for it. I mean, it's, you do see some um, like TikTokers and YouTubers just going like a bit far and just being like complete dicks to each other, and you're like, you don't need to do that all day long. And kind of, yeah. it's just tiring, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, and, like, it's sure. like going to McDonald's, but they sort of just like instantly pull a coke in the guy's lap, and you're like, like, you just do that all day every day. It's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's stuff you wouldn't do in normal life unless it was being recorded. Whereas ours is like genuinely good life experiences, regardless of whether the camera's out. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the difference. Also, we kind of like uh, just a general life rule of like, don't be a dick. Like, I think that just don't like being left with a sad taste or an I, I just feel like such a weird guy if I was going out to create that sort of discomfort in other people. And knowing that you're doing it so other people laugh, but you're not doing it so other people laugh, you're doing it so you progress your YouTube channel and stuff. Cause, like, your business is going around pissing people off. It's just, do not feel very nice and sit very nice. I think it kind of just like promotes the circle of people being idiots to each other to try and get famous and stuff. And been like the biggest failure you guys have had in terms of things you tried to do. I think there's two answers to that. There's one we tried doing, I mean, there's one where we released a video where we snuck back to to try and get Ed Sheeran to sing the Zach and Jay show intro, which is the Zach and Jay show. It's quite uh, spec patchy. I've got a lot of fans say as if they see us. And we tried to get Ed Sheeran, one of the richest and biggest singers in the world at that time, to sing it. And so we snuck back to his stage. I know we snuck back to his gig. We got kicked out. Then we snuck in again. The guy's like, how the hell have you done this? We were knocked on his sort. Apparently, we just missed him. But that in itself was a failure. But it was a great video in itself and a great story. So that went out and did really well. And I think kind of from a channel point of view, it's probably... It's, We've not. We've been lucky. We've not had any big failures. We've not had any. We've not lost loads of money. We've not uh, lost a lot of subscribers. We've been cancelled yet. Luckily, we've been talking about that recently about kind of club, how how easy it would be to get cancelled. Not because of what we do. We don't do anything like we're not behind the scenes racist or sexist or anything. It's going to be leaked. To, but it's just like yeah, I don't know. It's just a weird weird little time at the moment. So luckily, we've not had anything like that and. So I think the biggest one was when we did this thing called the Stuck Inside Show, where we did like three episodes a week. We doubled down on it. We thought it was going to be massive. It was when quarantine happened. So we were kind of pumped out a show that was very unique for quarantine and we're interacting with other creators in a collaborative way like no one else was doing. And essentially, it just didn't get very many views. It was like the lowest we'd had in ages. We lost a lot of momentum with the channel and what we thought was going to be massive and just wasn't and yeah we learned a lot about it we, we learned we need to kind of build our audience in different ways so we stopped an email list yeah our core fans did still love it it just didn't grow how we thought and i feel like that's the biggest project we put in the most energy and just didn't get the results we want but yeah i mean absolutely no regrets it was great learning and uh yeah good experience we did that really i'll say the tiger king video yeah we, so you, we, we paid the cost of tiger king yeah to say the mission was to like basically get to sing the words about of roses by outcast without realizing so he paid like 600 quid for the savings personalized messages but it just the end result was just so bad and, and we felt like we needed to put the video out because we'd spent this money in reality it just wasn't that impressive what we did and we spent all this the, the effort was still like high but it was it was a lot of effort and we went to late to do it but the results just were bad for it and uh, it's, it's, again it's good learning all this stuff yeah it's a really hard one when you sort of committed to something and it seems really shit but you feel like you have to finish it off and say so you do even though like, you really shouldn't it's a funny situation but yeah it's interesting about like the second shards which are not growing do you think it's just not so in line with the other things you're doing sort of out there and like Super fast things. Like I watched a um, few of like the when you got like Judy Dent on the call and that kind of stuff. That was pretty fun. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say how it's kind of the new version of the the stuff and slideshow because ultimately our, our content for this was all outside. We were kind of traveling a lot. We were exploring different traditions. Like, so we are still we're kind of on version two of the stuff and slideshow now. Where's the first that version? Is a lot of, of like it's smaller ideas based around like a, a talk shape format now we're just sticking to the one video a week where it's a real idea where we can it is more similar and in line with what we've done before but yeah i think you're right like that the audience expectations were 
they subscribed to us for these big kind of outlandish ideas. And then when we were just not doing that because we had three videos a week, like it just even less people were interested, which I think is completely fair to be fair. Yeah. Do you think you could have like spoken to your audience ahead of time and like asked a bit more? See what would have worked? Or do you think the people that actually bothered to respond to you would probably the people that love you so much they just say yes anyway? Yeah, I, I think so. It was overwhelmingly positive, the result. Like, we walked around our the comments were just, and, and we felt like the core audience just absolutely loved it. And when we stopped, they they were the ones who noticed the last about it. But yeah, I just feel like those were the views are the unbiased tell of how a peak video is, how shareable it is. So we could have just made that a plot decision, really. So I think, yeah, and you buy people who jaded. By how much they like, so I mean, may not be the precise answer. You in your content, yeah. Have you done like any sort of live shows where you just sort of let people come and ask you some questions about? But that wasn't really mainly audience; it was more like a business audience. So it wasn't really. Like, I meant like YouTube mm-hmm. live or something where you just kind of go, "Oh, it's Sunday, we're live, and you can ask us." Nah, maybe we did it tomorrow. Yeah, we did a telling show. All our Instagram. We haven't, yeah, we haven't done much of like a wide interact here, right? Look at that. Good shout. Yeah, I want to do more of that stuff. I feel like so much of YouTube engagement is based on the videos. It's just like videos a week. And if, if you make exciting videos, then you do more exciting videos. But I like the idea, like, we just released a newsletter, which is once a week. It's very much not a newsletter of updates. It's very much the best bits of the internet. It's called Good Shit Only. And it's uh, just good shit, really. It's like uh, music, podcasts. Everything starts with like a thought provoking quote. What else have we got in there? Like books, an inspiring story. Every every kind of news I was an inspiring story in that. It's just engaging with audiences in different ways. And I think, yeah, you're a live QA. We've even thought about doing like behind the scenes business stuff and some sort of business seminar on how to grow a huge channel. Just like in different ways, engaging with audience. You get a lot of engagement whenever I talk about like how to podcast with someone that's hidden tips. It's kind of interesting. I mean, I think for you, it might be a bit different because you've kind of built this growth mindset podcast from an audience, which is coming for kind of business content. For us, we get quite a mixed batch between people of what, like, that's one thing we realized from the Stuck Inside show is like, what have we built our audience up? It's going out there and doing big outlandish ideas that other people wouldn't. Do. Yeah, yeah. So more of like how to sneak into the shows or like <laughs> how to become friends with that show and that kind of. Exactly, yeah. So that kind of fun stuff when if we suddenly start, if we change all our content on YouTube to the business stuff, we got in touch with Gary Vee and I don't know, all that. Like, people wouldn't really rate it. We'd almost have to build up a new business following and grow like that. So I think we're just diversifying and going slowly. We set up an email list. We're not pushing it aggressively saying, you have to get on this. It's like, look, guys, if you want to get on it, get on it. And then it'll slowly grow up because it's kind of a good product in itself. Yeah, yeah. I think it's better to be more organic with these things rather than pay people to places where they actually want to be yeah much more of a failure interesting so yes on on that we can go into some top tips on how to <laughs> sort of do the things that you guys have been doing so how to like break into a show do you have like a checklist of like okay, right so you find like a gig that you want to break into what's like the process you guys then undertake it's going to be really boring but all you need is is one item without a, a high base yellow jacket and <laughs> quite literally that that's all you need in fact like sometimes you need even less like we've gone into gigs by by literally just picking up a, a bin bag which is outside the venue and carrying it <laughs> towards people and the main thing is like the that the conflicts in it acting like you're meant to be there and just as long as you are, are like acting in in a certain way you won't raise any sort of suspicion but yeah, I mean, the key to most events is a high boost jacket, a bit of confidence, really. And, and that's all you need. It's, it's, it's not that, that excited of, of, a, of an answer, really, but it literally is that simple. Interesting. So, I mean, I went to, I've got the name of the band now. They're really cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, the guy who was running that tour, um, I knew, so he invited me to come. So I went like backstage beforehand and stuff. But like, the process was so long to like, sorting like getting the right wristband and these things it's like it's been like an hour in like the office outside like the stadium kind of thing and yeah i just don't it just seems sort of like even if i had like a yellow jacket i still need to like have like the right wristband authority to get to places kind of thing it's, it's odd yeah but we've sort of found that if, if you kind of just walk 
like you're late or annoyed, <laughs> then people don't question you. If you look like you're on your way to somewhere, people is not gonna, yeah, especially with like a, a bin bag. It's just like, why would you be doing that other than like? Definitely. If, then people come and ask you what you're doing when you have like the whole like sort of, where do I go look? <laughs> but what, how do you know where you're going when you haven't been there before though? She used walk at a fast pace. You, you cover a lot of ground. Great. Just... To be fair, sometimes as well, the um, the festivals, especially, are quite big. You're actually hit to a little ride on the golf buggies occasionally, which is always quite fun. Yeah. Which festivals have you broken into that work then? Oh, loads, mate. Training fields, part life, Glastonbury, wireless. wireless. What was that? We are festival. If you run a business, you'll know that people are the most important thing in the company. Every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for a small business owner, because it is. Now, you want to be certain that you have the best candidates and screening tools available for you, which is why I recommend LinkedIn Jobs. I found it so easy to use for my hiring and it makes it faster to find the right people for your team. And it's free. Small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one for a reason. It's simple to set up your job, add screening questions so you're talking to the right people, and put the purple hiring frame on your profile, and you're ready to go. You don't need to waste so much time and money talking to the wrong people when you can use LinkedIn Jobs to find qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster for free. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash growth. That's linkedin.com slash growth, G-R-O-W-T-H for the unfortunate people at spelling like myself. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. But yeah, YouTubing success. So you spoke about like having like one a week, big things. Have you got maybe like your top three tips for how to be a successful YouTuber? Make ideas that make people feel deep levels of emotion. And it doesn't matter what that emotion is, whether it's excitement, nervousness, happiness, sadness, all the other spectrum, all the other emotions on the spectrum, sorry. Make them feel like a deep emotion. Keep the watch time is super key for it to get recommended. So keep the story moving. Don't at any stage let the story get done. One thing that we do is have our phone next to us when we watch a video, uh, watch when we watch a run through. And if at any stage you kind of go for the phone, we get a text, we get a bit bored. And that's what we know that the audience will as well. And so that's perhaps it's just like the thumbnail. The thumbnail is kind of like the packaging of a product and how good it looks. Like, you, like the video was almost like the toothpaste. I don't know, used this analogy before. But then like the, the thumbnail is like the pack and the title is like the packaging of the toothpaste. So you can have the best toothpaste. It gives all your teeth the cleanest wash. However, if it looks crap, then no one's going to actually buy that and use it and then keep using it and then share it. So yeah, get a good thumbnail, which grabs your attention. It's got one key focus. The thing we do is a squint test. So you're kind of closing your eyes a little bit and squinting at it. And you want to make sure that it's jumping out at you. You want to make sure it's clear what it is. Because when you're competing and you want to see the video, you want your to you want yours say your stand out. Three mistakes in terms of YouTube success. As in the people make, not just, as in talking things that you shouldn't do. <laughs> Yeah, I think people find success in certain certain things, certain styles of videos or certain bits of content. So for us, it'd be the sneaking into stuff and, and it does really well and it, everyone loves it. And But then your channel is stuck in a certain place and people expect that. And then as soon as you, whether that's legal reasons or creatively you want to try other stuff, you've built an audience based around one thing, which isn't doesn't have long-term sustainability. Especially if you'll become a popular and uh, like just a noticeable face in, in the sea, I guess. You can't go around and keep sneaking into spaces all your life because you will be on every security checklist ever. So we've seen other creators kind of get stuck in a niche and then try and pivot when it's too late. As a result, that that kind of engagement just drops off a cliff. That's kind of really scary. So one thing we did from the start was kind of diversify the content straight away. What's that called thing? Got, got it? Yeah, I said, yeah, that's a, it's a very good point that I think people get stuck in, in there, stuck in what they're doing or what they've done previously. 
and equate that with what they're doing and what they will do in the future. You don't want to do that. I, I think the one big thing for me is that, like taking YouTube seriously as a business. A lot of kind of a lot of creators are kind of young people, 22, 18, 24, 26, like they're kind of in young age stages of their life. And they've got to the 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 subscribers, which is so hard to do. And kind of takes five years, takes three years. It takes a lot of creativity, a lot of hours. And once they get there, they get money from brands, five grand here, five grand there. You do the, the merch. And they're making kind of maybe 30 to 50 grand a year. And they're kind of happy with that. But it's a very, very short lived thing. Audiences can go to other people. There's loads of creators for a lot more time. Platforms can change where TikTok becomes a new thing. And suddenly you could be left with getting 10,000 views a video instead of your usual 200,000 views. Um, you were making good money from brands back in the day, but now you're not. And suddenly you're looking around going, oh shit, I, that, that was a good two years on YouTube at its peak and five years to get there. When I think a lot of people, if with like a little bit more focus look on their child, could really kind of make something big for it and build, bring maybe bring products in or just have like, better strategic partners or a more of a long-term approach and make sure that if your platform does change, they're not massively vulnerable to it. So I think that's one thing that I'd say is like a lot of creators have done the hard work of building up big platforms, but then the, the real thing that should be on sustainability and not kind of celebrating, yeah, celebrating, but not kind of getting too excited where they're at and getting too comfy, I think is the key one. Yeah, interesting. Have you ever heard of Nassim Nicholas Taleb? He's like a business strategist, philosopher, person who talks about statistics and things. But he has this concept called anti-fragile where you should gain from disorder. So like YouTube is obviously like it's a pretty quick sort of new upcoming thing. So it's probably the other things will come along and sort of replace it or like different ways to sort of be successful on YouTube will happen. And so you kind of need to be ready for different things. Doing one thing, expecting that to work and keep doing the same thing. Exactly, yeah. I think if you're not disrupting yourself at competitor is, I think it might be Jeff Bezos or something like that. But yeah, you want to be innovating from the inside and disrupting yourself. Okay, cool. We've got a good first two tips. We're missing the third big mistake that people are <laughs> You'd say through. Um, t- so so uh, we, saw the, we saw the mistakes, are like top, top three mistakes to it. I'd say, I don't know, why don't you know the tweets? Yeah, yeah, a really obvious one. You're probably a very different person than you were when you were a 13, 14, 15-year-old when you first started using social media. This is this kind of age range. People don't vet themselves and kind of maybe look back at some comments they were making as a 15-year-old. You should probably do that. There's tools out there. Yeah, like you see multiple people get cancelled or careers get really dented as a result of that. A, saying stupid stuff as a kid, but B, having that in a public forum where it could be easily brought out, out come back to the home That's quite a, a quite hands-on, easy one to do. Yeah, that's quite useful. Good. <laughs> I should probably do that, actually. Yeah, no, everyone should do it. Like, I got, I got a Twitter notification today, which was nine, you've been on Twitter for nine years. So I was tweeting when I was, what am I now, 25, 6, but yeah, 16. I was just started drinking, just started chatting to girl, or we'd chat to girl before, but like girls were a thing, going to parties, I'd mess around with my mates, at 200 followers, like the world was absolutely nothing. I could have been swearing, could have been saying this, we're having banter as if no one's going to see, and then now we're suddenly just doing something else. But I could be a business person in sales, I could be a marketing person. If I said anything that's not that at the time was fine as a 15 year old, it can just be brought out of uh, proportion. And people kind of love to do that. People love, if they don't like it for a reason, they love to assign a week. So when really it might not be that bad. I mean, there are definitely things that people who pulled up where it is really bad, but there's definitely other things that, that aren't. That's kind of bigger than YouTube anyway, but that social and job in the uh, My jam, my storms into pretty much. I think I, I honestly believe that everyone, or a, such a high, like eighty-five percent of people who are in professional settings who are of, of our age, has, de- has said something before that is gonna that could be deemed as very unprofessional and maybe a sackable offence. And if they've said it, then they may have said it online to something to be careful about. 
yeah, very <laughs> good piece of wisdom. That it's sort of super obvious, but actually, I haven't really bothered to think, think about. Yeah, I mean, means that like we've been talking, like we've, we've been quite vocal about staying inside and the, like coronavirus in general, and we didn't think I think people are taking it seriously early, and so yeah, we kind of were isolating two weeks before the government. What was it locked that? And uh, yeah, we do want to allocate water to be very serious with the rules. And like, there's been times where we've gone to a shop. I've not been allowed into the shop, so I'm sat outside the shop waiting for Zach to get his things because we don't want to populate it. When someone like took a photo of me outside that shop, we're not like A-list celebrities in any way, shape, or form. But if we were A-list celebrities, that could have gone back on Twitter, like Jay from the Zach and Jay show. Oh, he's on he's YouTube he's on YouTube live stream raising money for the NHS charities. Oh, he's been saying all this about sitting inside, but he sat outside a shop having an ice lolly. What's that about? When really and then I could then argue, look guys, I was just waiting for my friend Zach, it's fine. But is everyone who hears that original message gonna hear my rebuttal? Well, let's first go into long term thoughts on YouTube being and sort of success there is like inferences. What do you think in five years' time is gonna be the bigger thing? Do you think YouTube will be not what it is at all and people will be on like something new that you wouldn't even be able to imagine right now or like the way that we use youtube will have completely changed but it'll still be huge but it's it's really hard to tell really it's really hard to say but i always think that's not really the question isn't what do you think it will be it's like trying to set up for a situation where it could be anything because stuff changes so quickly they should making sure you're ready to be in a position where if a new platform comes about you're making content that's optimized for it you're not going to slow to adapt really but well, I, I know that, like, at the minute, YouTube is paying creators more than any other company on the face of the planet. Like, they're, they're paying hundreds of millions a year to their creators, going 50 50 or ad revenue. And that is probably why, at the minute, they are the, the go to choice to build a community and, and kind of build an audience. But again, like, the meteoric rise of TikTok, like, the, the barrier to entry on that is super low. Everyone's got phone. You don't really have to edit. And if you can, you can do it. Yeah. And they've just literally taken over this. Yet, like, not taken over YouTube, but it's a completely different form of content, which it, a load of people are innovating on and, and making genuinely really good bite-sized, like digestible content, yeah. and it's super addictive. So you, I don't think you can really see what's coming around the corner because that trend is probably amplified by the fact that we're all indoors now and we're kind of watching content in a little way. So but like Twitch is coming about, yeah, TikTok's coming about, and essentially kids and people have got 24 hours in the day. If they're spending an extra hour on this new app that wasn't there before, that's an hour in the day which they're not spending on YouTube. And if they're spending it, Twitch is rising, TikTok's rising. They are kind of competitors in some way to for kids' attention. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not certain that YouTube will be uh, as big as it is. I, I don't think, I mean, it could be absolutely massive. I don't know, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's only really like me. Netflix is going to use There's this new app that's come out. It's like only 10 minute long shows that you can watch on your phone. Really? Is that Quibi? Yeah, it's the one which sort of it works if it's up or sideways. You could have no. don't know if you saw that. Yeah, yeah. It brings that what I think you are at a value you don't read. You need one bit six billion crazy. Yeah, stupid amounts of money to release it. I think Spielberg did some stuff like Frock Bell, right? Well, yeah, just did a series. But yeah, like Netflix, well, that Netflix it was well they're from it's ridiculous amounts of money at content, aren't they? I think Quibi and Deering and Yeah, like so like I don't think it's taken up that much. Well, it won't surprise me if one company did. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's the whole like VR side of things because as in the kind of quality of content's already had to like, go up a lot, as you've been saying, like having like drones and like interesting stuff showing up. So, and if you write really interesting things, like, it doesn't have to be fully good quality, but yeah, to keep that level of emotion and stuff that you're talking about, it's, and it's a lot easier if you just have better quality in the show, I think. So it's going to be a hard one to constantly keep up with but if you're at the front yeah you just have to keep trying what about you guys because you know you're clearly interested in business and other things besides just making videos do you think you're gonna maybe start an idea together or some form of business because you seem to have like quite a lot of interests and like i could imagine you guys you'd be really set up to like actually have a business that you kind of commercialize out of the fact that you've got a huge audience that do something that kind of is yeah. on brand. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this one to Jake. I've drank way too much water, so I'm gonna run to the toilet. I mean, I I I, will, I can talk about this for ages. So do you want to pause it, or do you want me to just talk? Because I can talk about this. Like, all right, go go go. 
So yeah, would you want to talk about business? Well, I mean, yeah, we've just done it. To be honest, we just have gone and created a business. We've uh, created a company called Germ Shield. Actually, we've not created a company yet, but we will do. It. But that is a product which is brass, so it's antimicrobial, and you can open up doors with it without touching doors. You can press the buttons in self checkouts in the co op and Sainsbury's without having to touch the self scanning screens. So yeah, we've got about one thousand five hundred of them landed. I think actually today, to be fair. That's kind of uh, something that we're just kind of, I wouldn't say messing around with, but it's something that we're uh, we're doing. Like you said, I think running a YouTube channel is the best. I, it's funny because so many people of the media and of the maybe the establishment or the, the zeitgeist look at YouTube as its little pranksters. Yet when you actually kind of look below the surface, and again, from first principles, it is just a perfect place to start a gorgeous, massive, profitable business. Yeah, there are so many people and so many founders and investors to talk about getting the first few people who love the product. And you just don't have that problem when you've, when you've got a huge platform. I, there was a story that the founders of Reddit would go to Apple stores and put Reddit on the Apple computers and see how customers would interact with it. And like, we could easily put up a link to something and have a thousand people on a website and we'd be watching how they do it. Like We've just got access to people who will not do what we say you believe what we believe so if we bring the product that in the line with those beliefs and values then we kind of think that they will do that as well because they've done it so far but the youngest billionaire in the world isn't a tech entrepreneur with a phd from harvard and you know or a dropout from harvard or living in silicon valley it's, it's kylie jenner who's got a million uh who's got 140 million instagram followers who's, who's a billionaire she's 21 years old from a platform the girl or the, the person who's Forbes number one on their 30, 30 list for Europe in retail and commerce isn't someone who's a tech genius. It's Grace Beverly, who's 23 years old, who's got 500,000 subscribers and a million followers on Instagram, who's making 15 million in her first year of businesses with two merch brands and fitness app that's got 100,000, but this, this making a lot of money. I don't actually know this figures. Uh, I know it's at least that though. I'm on. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So she's making just so much fucking money is the point. And, and she's 23 years old. She doesn't have the biggest following in the world. Like she's got less subscribers than us. She's got way more Instagram followers. But like, it's just such a perfect place to introduce innovative new products to the world and services. And I think I, that's the thing that I say to young creators. That's partly why that's my, that's my advice to them is like, it's don't wish away this opportunity or don't just like get lost in the sauce enjoy the views you get and the short term money you get because you can make an app, you can make massive things off the back of it really 100% it's kind of same with what I'm doing like building my podcasting app kind of thing it's, in, it's a sort of it solves my own problem of like annoyance of not being able to talk about podcasts that I really enjoy with other people but it's the sort of thing that I feel like my audience is kind of into because it's like a common problem that people have. No, I think it's good shout. I do I, I, I a lot. I remember saying it to you. I'm always kind of sharing podcasts. And the podcast is so weird. Like Spotify acquired, giving with me, like, showing, yeah, 100 million as a big move into, as a big move into audio. Yeah, it still just seems quite a crappy little platform for it. It's just podcast just seems absolutely massive now. Joe Rogan making all that money, et cetera, et cetera. And, Apple podcasting is just so crap. So yeah, I think the infrastructure and the tools and products that are going to be built around podcasting is going to be very interesting. Yeah. That's a big space. We shall see. <laughs> Maybe a few years time I'll be doing amazing or someone else will have done basically something similar or better than what I'm trying. We'll find out. It's kind of our roots, suppose, isn't it? Like it'll either be you or someone else who's better. <laughs> We're going to make the big with a bigger audience or something, maybe. <laughs> Find out. You were Sam Harris with uh, Waking Up. Yeah, as in his app went pretty huge pretty quickly just because he's got so many people that were already following. Yeah, exactly. That's another good example. Um, yeah, his Waking Up podcast, I paid for that. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Like, how many people have tried to launch meditation apps or put so much effort into it? And he just sort of, <laughs> he said, yeah, he was so slow to the game. It took him like years to actually build it and get it done. And then, like, millions of people download it straight away because they like him. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely worlds for like celebrity making businessy or well, influencers 
Yeah, definitely. And, and research, research has actually shown that YouTubers or young people are influenced more now by what, what, by what their favorite YouTubers are saying than their favorite movie stars. So I think if you went to a venture capital company and said, look, here's The Rock. He's absolutely massive. Everyone knows The Rock. He's been in all these movies. We want to do a business with The Rock selling protein sheets. That would instantly be such a valuable business. If you went to The Rock and said, who's a big YouTuber that they might not have heard? Yeah. PewDiePie's like the biggest in the game. Isn't he? Like, is it, like, I don't know, maybe KSI or something. We, we've got this uh, idea of uh, something to do with KSI, or like Nicole Milana, who's got two million... Well, thanks a lot to Zach and Jay coming on the show. It was really epic to talk to them. They have truly done some incredible things with their lives. Zach's motto for the channel is to build stories for the grandkids, and it's just great to see people living their lives and helping others at the same time. I hope that you learned something today and have some inspirational ideas from the stories of these savvy individuals. I've since spent a lot of time talking with Jay from the show, who has now built a good business helping other YouTubers succeed. So if you're genuinely interested in YouTube, then I would hit him up on Twitter or Instagram under Jamie Rawsthorne. And on that, if anything helped you from the show, take a moment to journal or think about it and share the show with a friend. It is how we grow after all. And if you enjoy doing absurd things, you are welcome to give a fantastic rating of the show on Apple, Spotify or YouTube, or of course, hit us up with a comment. Now, remember to enjoy today because you can't wait for some future goal before you start enjoying yourself. These future goals always stay out of reach because by the time you achieve one, there'll be another one to achieve. Life is lived today, so enjoy things today and be kind to yourself. And whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.